Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody. I'm Mahabeli from the American University in Cairo, and I'm one of the co-organizers of MyFest. And today I'm doing this workshop with Nicola. Nicola, do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Sure. Hi, I'm Nicola Pallet. I'm at Rhodes University, and I'm joining from a very dark uh, South Africa because we're having load shedding at the moment. But luckily, I've got a UPS going and I've got the iPad on the side here for some extra light. <laughs> we made it work. I'm here. So, if anyone, if for Mariam, you're in, you're in my institution. So, this is very similar to a workshop I gave earlier, but we have Nicola today. So, her perspective is going to make it a little bit different. Uh, but, you know, at some point, if you start to feel like this is too familiar, you're welcome to. to uh, all right, all I'm right. going to start. I'm going to share the screen. So we're talking about critical AI literacies today, and I'll put the link to the slides again because I think some people just came in. We are recording everyone. I hope that's okay. And always, always the first question is, how are you feeling? Tell us in the chat. How are you feeling today? Nicola, how are you feeling today while well, everybody typed? <laughs> I'm feeling excited and also warm. I've got a nice hot water bottle on my lap because um, it's been very cold here in Makanda, uh, formerly known as Grahamstown. Uh, Eastern Cape can get quite cold. Tony's saying he's alive, and Tony, we're so happy you're alive. Danielle, feeling busy. Heather is feeling good. Yeah, he's a bit tired. Long day with an early start. Already? <laughs> Jenny, so glad to be here. A bit overwhelmed outside of my fest. Yeah, I haven't seen you a lot, so I'm guessing something's going on. Jerome, I hope I'm saying your name correctly. It's feeling great, considering that we're still in shock at the insane cost of petrol. I'm so sorry. Uh, Virginia, tired after yesterday's session. I couldn't stop thinking. <laughs> the session of questions. <laughs> my name's feeling good. Chris, I had a long, had a long weekend. Go Juneteenth, right? Yesterday's Juneteenth. It's also my cousin's birthday, so I actually got confused about, you know, but yes, Slavery Abolition Day, definitely a great, great day. I only learned about this like a couple of years ago, actually. Yes, I'm mm -hmm. excited. They felt a little bit all over the place, but okay. Uh, the proper Slavery Abolition Day, like the real day it really happened versus the, the Abraham Lincoln Day. All right. And what is the metaphor you would use for AI? So Early in this whole AI thing, my mom said that she's a doctor. She has nothing to do with any of this, but she said AI is like junk food. Well, she said fast food. And we're thinking, how is AI like fast food? And it's a lot, in a lot of ways, it is like fast food. Um, so I, I thought the idea of thinking about metaphors for AI could be a useful thing. So let us know in the chat what kind of metaphors for AI that you would use. Nicola, is there one that you use a lot? That I can think of at the moment. Um. So Yasser and I are writing a paper with uh, a couple of other people, Anuj Gupta and Anna Mills, all about metaphors for AI. <laughs> so Kathy's saying paintbrush tool for creativity at the moment. Jenny is like a generic version of your favorite treat. It's nearly what you crave, but not quite what you really need. Tony, the ghost in the machine. Virginia, like conversation with your sister, no matter what you say, misunderstands you. That's really interesting. That, you know, I think, yes, I think someone said something like genie in a bottle or something, and the genie says it's going to grant your wish, but it doesn't always do it the way you want it to. I think that would be, that would be a good one to, to, to put in mind. <laughs> okay. All right. And how do you feel about the latest advances in AI? I mean, saying long lost cousin came back and knows everything. <laughs> and Jerome, like your mother, there's always a message for you. Okay. All right. Now, how do you guys feel about the latest advances in AI? I think those questions were all metaphors, right? And Jacob, I think that's also the first question. Super search, robot enhancement. And... Okay, so Danielle's saying she's worried about AI, won't be able to keep up but it doesn't help my impact my work. I think a lot of us who are in faculty developers feel that way as well. Chris guessing excited and nervous, managing dialectical as usual. Yeah, both together. 
intrigued, excited, concerned, initially curious now, but a bit exhausted. Yeah, I hear you on the exhausted. Like I can't, it's, it's difficult. Like someone just showed me today how you can integrate Scholar AI into GPT-4 and now it gives really accurate references. So all the limitations are <laughs> getting in the way. Uh, calculator, statistical model, welcome Nasreen. And Jenny's quite optimistic, potentially do great things and really unlock access to a lot of data information still reflects the most problematic bits of us. Charles, glad you made it. Worried about how it steals from writers and artists? Yes, that's an important one. Virginia, same way you feel about text, tool been always helpful. Nicola, takes work keeping up, can get overwhelming at times. Yeah, I agree with that. All right, so before we get into everything, have you ever played this game called Quick Draw? So I'm gonna I'm gonna just open it up on my screen here. Again, if you're at AUC, we just played this like two days ago or something. <laughs> Possibly yesterday. I can't remember which day it was. Uh, Sierra, you're curious and optimistic and wondering if it'll lead people to become lazy with this. So if you've never played this game, this is a really uh, cool game to play on your phone. Basically, Google created it to learn how humans doodle, and I'll tell you what it did with the results. But basically, you can use it on your phone. You don't need to open the app. You can just use it on the browser right away. Um, I have a touch screen, so it's easy to draw on my laptop. So I'll just show very quickly. So it's going to ask me to draw something, and then it's going to try to guess what it is because it can pretend not to know what it is. All right, feel free to play it on your own as I play it as well if you've never played it before. So one last. And it figured out. Oh, camouflage. This is one of the. Dumbbell. Jerome, you need to play on your side, not mine. <laughs> Don't draw on my. Oh, I got that one last time I did this and it didn't like my picture, but I think. Oh, is that, oh, that's not a screwdriver. What's a screwdriver? Someone remind me what a screwdriver is. It, is it this one? Isn't this a screwdriver? What's this? All right. Has any, has, a, have a, go ahead. That's a, what you drew before was a power. Yeah, a drill, because I got drill last time. Right. <laughs> and so I just, I confused them. But eventually I remembered. Okay. So did anybody else get a chance to play on their own? How was that? So the basic idea is that the, the way Google works is it doesn't tell it's it, the, the, the AI that's learning here doesn't know what a wine glass looks like or what a rake looks like or what a postcard looks like. What it does is it learns from how other people draw them. And so if you look at how other people drew it, that's how it guesses that, oh, if you have like some lines and a, and a circle or and a square or a rectangle on the side, then it understands that this is what it is. Um, and like camouflage for me was always a confusing one because I didn't understand that this is what they wanted, that they want an army uniform. This is apparently what everyone was drawing. I used to think it was about butterflies and stuff. Uh, dumbbell, looks like a bone, looks like a lot of other things, but enough to look like what other people have been drawing. Did you notice when I was drawing the rake that it guessed it? pretty early, like before I even finished, because I think apparently people start drawing it the same way. So they, it figures it out pretty quickly. So that's how it works. And then the results of what this AI has been doing goes into another uh, tool called AutoDraw. And AutoDraw is sort of um, the opposite 
So I will draw something and then it will guess what it is. So I want to draw a flower. And it understands, but it gives me like different kinds of flowers, prettier flowers than the ones that I would have done myself. So it learned how humans doodle in order to help humans now draw things better. So if you want an icon that looks neater than what you would have drawn on your own, this is me trying to do rainbow. Doesn't understand what I'm trying to do. Give me a Wi-Fi sign. <laughs> anyway, that's that's basically the AI learning from data rather than knowing what something actually looks like to begin. With. Um, so I usually use this game to to teach my have fun with students, but also teach them how to do that. You can't draw a steak, okay? <laughs> you if I just keep doing this. My daughter loves this game. We play a lot. Yeah, this is about the way image generating AI works. Yeah, so it's about pattern recognition, which is not exactly the way. Um, it's not exactly the way ChatGPT learns, but it's the same idea, you know. Yeah, link to the slides. Oh, sorry, we'll give you the link to the slides. Someone give her the link to the slides, please, because Alia helps. <laughs> All right, so I'll move on. I'll, I'll move this to you, um, Nicola. Cool. Thank you, Maha. And I think that was a very useful kind of experiential way of kind of um, getting a feel for how AI works, even though you said, you know, it doesn't work exactly in the same way. And I am aware that there are many uh, folks in the room who might know a whole lot about AI already and possibly even more than I do. Um, but we always like to just make sure people are a bit, you know, kind of on the same page and perhaps I share something new. Uh, <laughs> hopefully that that's the case for you today. So I'm just going to, you know, just do a little overview of what, what generative AI is in a nutshell and specifically starting with ChatGPT because that's the one most of us know about. So ChatGPT is a chatbot. It was developed by OpenAI. Um, it's the one that most people know of or have heard of or played around with. And it's partly because it's received the most public attention um, since it's the most accessible and user-friendly, I think, of many of the AI tools that's out there, it had over a million users within the first five days after it was released, which is kind of crazy. Um, so the GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. In this case, it generates text, and it's been given a large amount of information um, that it's been pre-trained with. And the tree transformer describes the architecture of the particular AI model um, that it's based on. And there are many, many different kinds of AI models out there. ChatGPT is built on the GPT-3 family of large language models, so also known as LLMs. And this is basically a statistical model of text that contains sequences of words that have been scraped from the internet up until, I think, October last year. So the, yeah, the free version. Um, so it's not everything that's on the internet right now, which I think is currently the case for tools like uh, BARD, for example. Um, and this sort of data that it works with is stored on a 540 gigabyte database. Um, so it's not currently connected to what is available on the internet. And yeah, it's often referred to as an AI writer, but I think we need to remember that AI writing tools do not actually write, they generate text. So when you ask a question by putting a prompt into the chatbot, you basically are giving an instruction for this tool to find related fragments of text. Um, so it generates a text output or response as ones that are the most likely or the most probable in statistical terms that are associated with the text in your question or prompt. So for example, the cat sat on the, you know, it would say the mat because most of the text on the internet uh, that is scraping or from this database, as I mentioned, this offline one, uh, says that it's the mat. So this is why sometimes, um, you know, people describe chat GPT as a calculator for words. And the other thing to remember is that AI does not currently understand the text it's out, it, it's, 
is outputting. So our brains are actually, you know, a lot smarter. We're able to interpret texts in light of other texts that we've engaged with, um, but AI tools are not currently there yet. So some of the limitations, I think we need to remember that um, you're getting text that is most probable, not necessarily correct, because the database it uses, as I said, is up to uh, October 2021, so you're not going to get the most recent information. It lacks evaluative judgment because it doesn't rank texts um, or different sites that it's scraping for reliability, quality, trustworthiness. It often will mix up UK and US English. Um, so the spelling is very likely to be inconsistent. And if you're working with students and wondering, you know, perhaps using uh, text detection, uh, AI detection software, this is generally one of the ways that you can spot whether they've used AI or not. Um, the other one, I think, is that it, to remember that it doesn't reference what it outputs. Even if you do use a follow-up response, asking for sources, it can even lie or make up sources, which is when we say that AI is hallucinating. Um, and the other one that we're going to talk a bit more about is that the internet has a lot of, the, the content on the internet is, is definitely skewed. Um, so we're going to discuss bias. It's got to do with the majority of English language content on the internet that comes from the global north and the AI output we get from ChatGPT um, and other AI tools often carry traces of the biases of these societies. So we've got to ask critical questions about where, where these generated texts come from, whose views are being represented or marginalized and so on. Opportunities, I think, you know, ChatGPT and AI tools are useful for generating initial ideas, but we need to de develop these texts further, as well as our own voices, right? You definitely, when you read an AI response, um, you can, it sounds like very AI, it doesn't sound quite natural. So often you've got to work with it um, to get your own voice across, and you decide how best to use generative text generated text and link ideas in a way that you know demonstrates critical thinking and through regularly you know learning uh, using these tools and learning from our experiences we also start to develop AI literacy which we'll talk more about as well um but yeah next slide please Maha they are so Nicola, many you, do you want me to put that link in the chat the short link is that a document I, yes thanks for reminding me so this is a very very short um, guide. It's literally two pages for folks getting started with AI. If you need something that uh, to explain to your students about AI tools, ChatGPT in particular, and you're looking for some tools to try out, um, I think this is a useful guide for anyone um, getting started. Thanks, Nicola. Pleasure, our, our local one is like, <laughs> I don't know, 20 pages long or something, so that's useful to have it curated to the most important thing. Yeah, and I'm sorry, even my AI in a nutshell turned out to be quite long, um, <laughs> but there are so many AI tools out there and the list is just growing daily. Some of you may have heard of or tried out some of these um, AI tools already, um, and perhaps you have some favorites. You can share in the chat, maybe there's some others. Um, yeah, and next slide, please. We've discussed a lot of these already, I think. Yep, no, that's fine. And next one, just to say that with GPT-4, um, basically, it apparently it will lie a whole lot less because there are, you know, reduced hallucinations. And with time, it's apparently going to get even better. So we'll see what the future holds. Back Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> so I recently came across this paper with student perspectives on on AI, and I thought it was interesting because they talked to us about well, they not talked to us. I mean, they were talking about how they might find AI useful, and so some of them have said it helps them overcome writer's block. Um, although you know, one would argue, yes, it'll get them going, but is it getting them going in original directions or in the directions we want them to go or that they would have gone because especially if they're not from the global north is it forcing them to think like an american person you know 
The second thing is students are saying it's useful to modify text, summarize readings, or assist with writing. Uh, they said it's helped with translation. But again, like translation has existed before ChatGPT and it's choppy. And so if it's something really serious and important, it can go wrong, right? Um, the other one is some people use it as a tutor. So it acts like a one-on-one -on -one writing tutor and they can ask it questions and get feedback on their ideas and writing. And this is also very tricky for me because if it's not always accurate, how can we trust it to do that for us? I think it can give, I've never tried it for something that I don't know. Well, I've tried it with things that I know and it does give good feedback, but if I didn't know, if I was a student, I wouldn't know that this was correct. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah. And this one about editing writing serves as a more comprehensive alternative to current editing tools. And Jenny is saying, yeah, lots of discussions on the immediate exclusion of students whose first languages in English when AI tools are adopted with them. And then on the other hand, it helps people who are learning in English, but who are not native speakers sometimes who have confidence issues. But the issue is, will they ever develop confidence? Does it force them to feel like they have to speak this particular type of English that ChatGPT writes? It has, it has a, a very disconnected writing voice, but it's very grammatically correct most of the time. The thing is that AI that has existed before ChatGPT, all the different kinds of AI, things like um, proctoring tools that use AI and uh, all kinds of tutoring that uses AI, all kinds of facial recognition AI, AI that's been used in the criminal justice system. A lot of that has been, even the AI, the Google search AI and YouTube and stuff, it's racist, it's ableist, it's sexist, it's riddled with assumptions. And this includes large language models like ChatGPT, as, um, as Nicola was saying. Nicola, this is your slide. I don't remember what you were gonna say here. I think that one comes a whole lot later, or uh, maybe we moved it. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Do you want to? Well, we can still speak to it. What do you think? Yeah, do you sure. Want to move it? Go ahead. I think that that's part of it is is getting students to also not just engage with the tool, and this is where the critical AI literacies come in, but recognizing inequalities and biases, and perhaps that's part of the process of learning. So um, Bode has this idea of sustainable assessment, which looks at, mm -hmm. you know, not just content, but the processes of learning. So if students were to disclose how they were using AI tools as part of an assessment, you know, we're not just looking at that final essay or presentation, we're also looking at the process. Um, and it's about, you know, forming this capable person who can engage in a professional, you know, work um, and being an informed citizen. You know, we often think that, you know, learning doesn't end when the assignment hand, hand in has passed. Um, so it's a useful idea for how we're thinking about designing assessments with AI. <laughs> I, I never knew how to pronounce his name, so it's Bowd, not Bowd. Anyway, he, he writes generally really, really well about reflection and writing and, and uh, this emphasis on the process of learning, which I, 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 Mariam, we were earlier talking about this in a meeting locally about having students have a meta reflection on the process of their writing, not just the output. Uh, and that will take them beyond, I think, the AI. So there's a couple of things in the chat that are cool. So uh, Tony Carr was talking about diversity training for AI. So he's referring to the earlier bias, right? And Jenny's saying, if it only, if you can only use what it eats, so maybe it needs a more varied diet. So that's an interesting way of thinking. And I think a lot of people do think that's one of the things that can be done to improve AI and make it less skewed in its uh, worldview. Um, Virginia is asking, do we know what the basis is? They have not let us know, but we know that earlier versions of GPT were trained on things like Reddit and public internet in general. So the public internet in general is mostly white, male, Western. So I think whatever sample of that they get, that's what they get. But there's a few things that they've done to chat GPT, especially, which I'll talk about later, to make it not fully, completely just based on the uh, uh, just based on the white Western perspective. But uh, Nicola, I think you were trying to tell me that we should move this down, but I think since it's here, let's just go ahead and go ahead and present it because this is one of, based on the work that we've done with Daniela, who's also with us today. Yeah, sure. So this is our, um, some of you might know our work on compassionate learning design. So we've kind of been working on taking it as, 
a step further and applying it to how we design classroom like activities and assessments with AI and allow for more student voice and student, you know, who we always say, you know, what does it involve? Who has the more power? Is it the students or the teacher? So, you know, often on, on the, on the, the left-hand side, it's where the educator has all the choice and makes all the decisions. And then towards the right is where we have, you know, a lot more student agency. So for example, on the, on the left, let's start with the most, and I think this is often because educators are, perhaps it's early days of using AI, you know, it can evolve. Um, perhaps it's also because they're, they're just trying to get familiar themselves. So where the educator would decide which AI tool to use and scaffolds a preferred use in the classroom, and then decides on criteria for appropriate use um, without any inputs from students. So this is the right and the wrong way to use it. And the, and the educator models the use of the tool and puts in the question prompts and then you know, analyzes the output and scaffolds this kind of critical AI literacies through demonstration, but doesn't let the students try. Whereas the four is, you know, the educator might ask students what tools they're familiar with. And that informs, you know, perhaps selected tools for, a, for an activity. And the criteria for appropriate use can be can sometimes be decided by educator in advance. Whereas with the width, the educator would perhaps invite students to make suggestions for revising the criteria and um, for how to use AI tools and assessments. Um, by is when there is, you know, more familiarity established with AI tools, and maybe the students decide on criteria for appropriate use. And perhaps they even make this official in uh, an assessment brief. Um, and then the as is where the students would establish and share strategies and their experiences of using AI tools to support their learning um, or perhaps use how they used it for a particular assessment. And they decide on the criteria and appropriate use and share these as a you know reflection to accompany a submission. Maybe there's a forum. Um, that's shared on this topic, but kind of creating spaces that are intentional, such as, you know, study groups that happen organically, but where educators, you know, you might create spaces for interactions like this in formal courses. Ma, would you like to add anything? No, I'm just, I'm just uh, really impressed by how brilliant this slide is. <laughs> I'd <laughs> forgotten what was on it until you <laughs> I know I presented it like a month ago, but it's a good slide. <laughs> this is an example of the kinds of things. So those of you who are at AUC, this is an example of the kind of thing I cannot share at AUC in an official capacity, <laughs> but the kind of thing I do with brilliant people like Nicola and Daniela outside of <laughs> And I see Tony's comment, presumably this could all get skewed by institutional policy. Yes. I think definitely if your institutional policy is around catching and policing students this would not go down well <laughs> especially the buy and the as um and i think that that also makes us question i think about the role students have in the assessment process and often how little you know we acknowledge their creativity and and potential yeah as heather says it's a matter of trust and you can have institutions like right now, my institution has a pretty flexible policy in terms of um, uh, what each person can do, but you'll have multi-section courses that have, they still all have to do the same thing. So that no matter what you do, you have to convince all the others who are teaching the same course to do the same thing so that it's fair to students, right? And that this may be too radical for certain people uh, versus when you're teaching your own course, nobody else is teaching it, whatever, it's not a prerequisite, it's something else, you have a lot more freedom to, to do what you want. There's a question in the chat also about um, a citation, and MLA have the best approach to citing AI that I've seen. I don't like the APA one. The APA is just citing it like a personal conversation, which is like almost like not citing, I mean, yeah, admitting it's from AI, but not really citing it, but the MLA, asks you to write the prompt, what was the prompt that you gave the AI? And I think that's important. Like, I wanna know this output that the student got, what was the prompt that they gave the AI that gave it that, gave that up? 
Um, yeah, do you want to say anything here, Nicola? Yeah, so that kind of thing you would include if, you know, if a student has a, a piece of work, uh, perhaps a rationale that accompanies an assignment with, that has the prompt and the AI text outputs, and they can discuss and, you know, how they um, adapted that. <laughs> but this could be a lot more work the other hand on the other hand a lot more work for the educators because it means a 10 page essay going to a 30 page essay um and whether that is actually sustainable for educators marking is another issue yeah that's a good point so here's the mla uh style citation guide for whoever wants it so I use APA in everything, but I ask my I'm going to ask my students to use Emily for for citing AI. All right. So um, speaking of critical AI literacy, which we think we need as educators and students need it, and the critical aspect is, you know, when I use the term literacy, um, and a lot of times literacy is used to to talk about uh, being, you know, able to read and write. But I think when I use literacy, like in the sense of digital literacy, to me, it's about also not just being able to do the thing, the, the what and the how, but also knowing why you're doing it, recognizing the ways in which it could go wrong, be able to use it wisely, right? And being able to not use it when the time is wrong and, and, and using the right tools at the right time for the right purpose, that kind of thing. Um, and so it has the knowing and understanding, the using and applying, the evaluation and creation, and then there are ethical issues that we need to be aware of. So I made this diagram based off uh, of a blog post of mine where I talk about these. So I think there's the how it works, which, um, which uh, Nicola just explained to us, and the, the, quick, the quick draw kind of helps a little bit imagine it. But then there's the biases that we also mentioned because of the training data. And then there's inequality. So even though Nicola just said, ChatGPT is the most accessible. It's actually not accessible in Egypt. It's blocked in Egypt, like not blocked by our government, like OpenAI have not made it available in Egypt or Saudi Arabia. A couple of other countries have that problem that I know of. Um, I think Morocco and Hong Kong being among them. Um, and so it's not actually in Italy, but Italy blocked it as a country. I'm talking about OpenAI, the company blocked it in Egypt in the first place. Um, however, we do have access to the Bing AI, Apparently not very difficult, and the Bing AI is actually better than ChatGPT, and we access it through something called Po.com, which has that does not check where you are or your phone number or anything. So that's one of the inequalities. Although of course there are other inequalities in terms of like the digital literacies of people being able to use it or not, um, so on. Then there are the ethics of use, which I'll talk about very soon, and the ways that these AI have been created. But one of the ethical issues is those huge databases and that huge amount of training that actually is not good for climate change because it has a very huge carbon footprint, which we never think about when we think about these things. So students need to know about this and they need to know about some of the ethics of the ways it's been trained, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and also what does it mean about the copyright issues, right? Like there are people who created images that then get used by AI to create other images without the permission of the people. They don't get compensated for their art and so on. Uh, you have no idea you're getting you know what we teach students about paraphrasing and citing references ChatGPT does not cite its references we have no idea where it got this information from we have no idea about its credibility but just the fact that someone wrote this somewhere and nobody's acknowledging where where this is coming from is problem um the other two things is like we need to teach our students when where and why to use ai when is it a good idea when is it problematic to use it and this will take time for them to figure out when is it like credible or less credible? When is it ethically problematic not to use your own words? Um, when could they get into trouble for doing that? When might it do a better job? When might it do a worse job than you? Um, and prompt engineering is also one thing that we can teach our students if you don't know, just search for courses on prompt engineering. There's a lot of courses. There's on LinkedIn, uh, there's on Coursera, I think. There might be others. I haven't tried them, honestly. But we have some, we have a slide later about prompts and prompting AI more intelligently, and we have Mark Moreno who's coming soon to give a workshop on that. So there was a, a note though about AI detectors and language and inequalities. If you haven't seen this article, researchers in Stanford discovered that uh, AI detectors are more likely to call 
a non-native speaker's English paper, AI, even when it isn't AI. So that's important to keep in mind. And I think it's because non-native speakers maybe write in more formulaic ways. Uh, so they're less likely to do random things that native speakers would do. So we talked about the biased data sets, the inaccessibility in some location. It can reproduce some oppression. We know this with facial recognition and criminal justice AI. And it's extractive. It learns from users. We don't know about the privacy policies. Like what is it, what is it doing exactly with the user data as we experiment with it? So don't let your students, don't force your students to use it if they don't want to. Because um, we don't know what's going to happen with this. We don't want, like, I don't want, for example, to let it, you know, those AI that record voices and then they put the voice on a, another person or they get your video and your audio and they do things like, I'm so scared of recording my voice anywhere now that it will take my voice and then do things with it without my permission. I'm very concerned about that. Uh, so we know that AI is extracted that way, like a lot of tech companies in general, generally. The other thing related to like the kind of output it produces is we've been training students to write like robots a lot of times, very formulaic stuff. So it's not surprising that the AI writes like that too. Um, this uh, this UNESCO document is, oops, sorry. Oh, well, anyway, this UNESCO document was useful. It came out a few months ago, maybe a couple of months ago, uh, like a quick start guide to chat GPT and AI. And it has this, diagram of you know when is it safe to use chat gpt does it really matter if the output is true and someone told me it does it doesn't it always matter that the output is true but like sometimes you're just doing something creative like you know rephrase the title of a workshop or you know something like that where it's it's or ask it to write fiction or something and so in that case it's okay but when we, when it does matter that the output is true the person needs to ask themselves do i actually have enough information do i know have enough expertise to verify whether it's true or accurate or not. And if you don't have the, the expertise, like most undergraduate students won't, then maybe not a good idea to use ChatGPT. But if you are able to verify the output, then are you able to take responsibility if something goes wrong? And if so, then maybe it's possible to use ChatGPT. I don't know if GPT-4 is much, much more accurate. I don't know what criteria it would be using to be more accurate. I assume it'll get more accurate with time, um, but I think that's the problem. The more accurate it gets, the less skeptical we become of it, then the 10% or the 5% that it gets wrong will keep slipping through the cracks. It's kind of like, you know, with fake news, when it's 90% correct and 10% incorrect, you'll miss it because you'll think, oh, all of this is true. I know it's true. And so the new piece of information that isn't true, you'll be less skeptical of it. It'll, it'll seem credible to you. Um, so I'm just checking the chat, Virginia, brainstorming. Yeah, brainstorming doesn't need to be true per se. Pritka saying a uh, few educators on a forum you visited said whether students copy and paste the assignment, ask GPT if it wrote it. Yeah, but ChatGPT doesn't, first of all, yeah, you shouldn't copy student text into ChatGPT without their permission because that's a privacy violation and a copyright violation. But also this thing of asking ChatGPT if it wrote it, uh, it'll, it's pretty random about whether it says it wrote it or not because it did that with me once and I said, no, that's not true. I wrote it. And it's like, oh yeah, that's right. You wrote it. So it's not really, <laughs> that doesn't really work very well. Anyway, um, uh, my child, this, this whole thing about credibility, my child is 11 and playing with the AI for a couple of weeks. And she's like, of course, if I want credible information, I'm going to Google it and find out what the source is. I'm not going to use ChatGPT for that. So this thing that we have right here is, and yes, that I did not create alternative text for it because there's so much text, but it's about, it's a cheat sheet. And it's just telling you how you can possibly uh, prompt ChatGPT a little bit more smartly. So you tell it to act as a lawyer, a therapist, a ghostwriter, a project manager, prompt engineer, whatever. And then you give it a task, you're creating a headline, a cover letter, a blog post, tell it what kind of thing you want, right? And then show it as a table, a list, summary, code, PDF, whatever. I think that works better for GPT-4 than for the regular chat GPT. I don't know if it works well for other types of AI. And then prompt that will save hours for the day is to ask it to simplify complex information, like break down X topic into smaller, easier to understand parts, give real life examples and analogies, or something like learning from mistakes. I made a mistake while practicing a certain skill. Can you explain what went wrong? How I can avoid making the same mistake in the future. You can ask it to memorize information. I don't know how that's going to work, really. What are the most important? Well, it just makes you extract the most information, important information. 
Or you can ask it to learn your writing style and apply it again. You can ask it to apply knowledge of something into a new uh, question. I don't know how well it does on these things, honestly. Um, yeah, I'm really not sure. So these are prompts that people are saying are a good idea to try. Uh, I've tried it a little bit for those things, but it's not always great. You learn as you go with it. Sometimes you get the, the output and then you keep going and, and trying something new and asking it to get better. And eventually you figure out how to prompt it. That's, that's my, my way of doing it. Um, Nicola, something interesting in the chat that you wanna tell me what's going on in the chat? So I think just the this question of I think it was Meg, yeah, what are the legal ramifications of putting student work into ChatGPT? On the flip side, <laughs> sort of how would anyone know? I'm kind of playing devil's advocate here is mm -hmm. like word of mouth when you ask a student, did you use AI? And because of the false positives of detection software, and they, if they say no, um, chances are they could be lying, they could be telling the truth. Um, and the legal kind of frameworks and things that exist at the moment, from what I know about conversations in South Africa, is that a lot of the existing terminology kind of doesn't fit. So even, um, you know, sort of why would one, I suppose, um, as Maha said, it's got to do with data, uh, you know, privacy, those are, that is the student work. Um, but also, what is the educators, you know, why would they do that in the first place? Um, as you said, it's to ask ChatGPT if the student wrote that assignment, um, perhaps in the absence of knowing how to or not trusting AI detection software. Um, so yeah, it's a tr it's, it's, it's just a very tricky one. Um, here, I know there have been a lot of conversations, people seeing it more as, as cheating rather than plagiarism. Mm -hmm. um, different places... Um, you know, they might have come to the other conclusion, uh, you know, different conclusion. And mm -hmm. even if it's a conclusion yet, we don't know. Um, and I think Jenny gave, a, she said, Meg, we're advising against it as our institution, the students still hold the copyright of their work, we'd have to seek permission. Um, mm -hmm. The UK would change for internal systems. Um, if we had I, an AI driven feedback tool or something. So I do know that a lot of the, you know, Cambridge, Oxford um, have actually turned off Turnitin's AI, uh, AI detection feature. Mm. So yes, they've actually opted out. Um, yeah. Whereas, you know, when it first came out, it wasn't possible. So they thrust yeah. this um, and this feature onto us. And I think it's created a lot of, you know, people have turned it in, it's gotten a lot of flack from yeah, the yeah it's so bad it's so bad i tested it when it first came out on 30 plus uh things and it's so inaccurate like it's and first of all if a student writes an entire essay with ai and then puts it through quillbot which is another ai that paraphrases it it gives you zero percent so that's the first thing and students will figure that out like in one second um and then if you write something completely with ai and then you paraphrase a little bit It'll give you something like 5% AI. And then sometimes it flags the text that is human written as AI, not the AI text. So it's it's really problematic that way. It'll give a lot of false positives. And we told our faculty this as soon as it came out, and they still used it. This is the problem. And yeah, I don't I don't I don't I don't know if we knew that we could uh, take it out, but once they see it, it's really hard to tell them, nope, we're taking it out, you know? Mm. So there's going to be folks who, you know, if you say, yes, we're going to, you know, opt out, there are going to be people who say, no, we must keep it. <laughs> and then in yeah. a month's time, Jonathan's probably going to charge yeah. us for it. Um, of course, of course. <laughs> yeah, that's why they're giving it to us because they want to charge it, but they're they're stupid because they didn't test it properly. And now they, everybody knows <laughs> they tested it on not real data. And so when it came out into the real world, it didn't. So. Mm. And I think uh, a lot of people... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, a lot of the chat um, folks are talking about ethics and, you know, that ethics, uh, Danielle says, hasn't been discussed enough in education. Um, so there wasn't a culture of intentionally ethical education. Now we see so many problems with AI. We're having to catch up on ethical practices that should have been there all along. Yeah, very true. And I think that is the 
kind of the scaffolding that I find myself doing is helping lecturers make sense of that AI detection feature and what are, what are the next steps or, or you know, what are the considerations? Have you uh, taught your students, um, shared with them appropriate uses of AI in your course? Have you asked them to disclose, um, you know, created opportunities for that kind of thing? Um, and have you got, you know, is it explicit in your assessment brief that they should not use it for a particular activity? So there's so much at kind of happening at the moment. So one lecturer, they actually told their students, look, um, we're going to send you this warning, but in this case, it is a shared responsibility. We should have taught you more about this um, rather than just punishing you. So next term, we're going to be doing this more intentionally. Um, and I think that's that's something, an area that a lot of educators need, I think a lot of support with at the moment, is how do they support their students in using it critically, ethically, yeah. um, other than the copy and paste approach. Uh, Fatima Rahman, who's I think in WITS in South Africa, um, just shared something about indigenous framing of AI ethics, You're saying Maori culture and five principles to steer development and evaluate AI use as well. This sounds amazing. And this, uh, I don't know if that's a different article, five tests designing valuing AI according to indigenous Maori principles. That's amazing. Thank you so much. I am so curious about this. And um, Jenny also posted a link about sentient soldiers. Are you guys able to save the chat? Because I can, but I don't know if you all can. Okay. So these are the five tests. I'm just gonna look at it real quick. So interesting. What are the five tests? <laughs> can I make AI summarize this article? Uh -huh. I think this is probably going to need a, a deep read, but thank you so much for that. All right, so this one. Um, does anyone know why I refer to AI as, or OpenAI as the company that made ChatGPT as a wolf in sheep's clothing? Does so anyone know about this? So if you try to ask ChatGPT to say something offensive about a certain group of people, it will probably say, I cannot do this. It's against my values or something like that. Have you seen that? Yeah, we still don't know where this testing data came from, but this is even worse than that. So they've been trying to train the AI to be ethical by not saying offensive things and using swear words and using violence and things like that. And in order to do that, they had to use humans to do that. So they had humans filter what they what it does. But the way they did it is they outsourced it to a company in Kenya. And other than paying them very low wages, these people had to see, because they also have a visual AI, they had to read and see some really violent and distressing content in order to filter it out so that we don't see it as part of the chat GPT output. And then those people's mental health was affected. And then it wasn't, it didn't, it didn't help them with that. So they basically, uh, yeah, workers' rights. Very big problem. They're forming a union now. That's great, um, but it's just in order for us to get this very clean and polite AI, other people have to suffer in the process. And so, that's just something to remember. Um, don't just look at the outcome or the product of what a company creates, but figure out, like, think about the process they used in the process of creating it. Um, this culture of transparent assessment we've talked about already. Um, we, several of you were talking about, I think, is it plagiarism or not plagiarism? And Sarah Elaine Eaton, who writes about academic integrity a lot, has recently been talking about the post-plagiarism era. Like, if we try to determine where the human ends and where the artificial intelligence begins, it's pointless and futile. She thinks in the future will become that. It will be pointless what we're trying to do here. Um, and she's saying that historical definitions of plagiarism will not just be rewritten, they will be transcended and policy definitions can and must adapt. Our policy right now is not to change the policy in my institution. I think we're still waiting and see to see what's um, going on. Let me just put a link to Sarah's uh, post so that you can look at it later. Um, and just to give us more time to go through the slides and then talk. 
amongst ourselves, right? Um, these are other games that you can use to explain AI. So other than quick draw, there's one called real or fake text. There's one called which face is real. I'll put the which face is real one. Have you ever seen this one before? I can show it really quickly. Um, and then if you want to try it on your side, but basically these are AI generated images. Some of them are real people. Some of them are not. I would say, how am I going to click to say which one is real? I'm correct. So one of my friends discovered how to know which one is real, but uh, does somebody want to call out which one you think is real? The one on the right or the one on the left? Which one's a real person? The one on the right, the man with the beard. Yeah. You know why? His face expressions are expressive. Something about his eyebrows and hair. I'm not sure, to be honest. Really? <laughs> look at these eyes. If you look at the eyes oh, on this. the left, not the person who's in the middle of the picture, but the person on the side, those eyes are weird. Like the, the person who's, who can only see one of his eyes. Okay, what about this one? Which one's real? They look like the same person. <laughs> A little bit. Which one do you think is real? The one on the right? I think the left, but I'm not sure. One more vote, right or left? The left. Left, left, well, left. Left is real. Okay, left is real. Yeah. All right, oh one my more. God, this is scary. It was correct, the left was real? Yeah, yes. the left was real. Which one's real here? They're right. <laughs> Face smoothing is a giveaway. What's the giveaway? Face smoothing. Oh, so you think because this one is not smooth, so it's the real person? Maybe more likely because a lot of the images that are yeah, coming out of right. AI are very pretty. Are they? Let's do one more. So I'll, uh, my, my colleague had a theory and she's mostly correct but not always correct. All right, which one of these is real? Right? Right. Okay, you've gotten them right every single time. <laughs> All right, but we're, you're different people, but anyway. <laughs> so my colleague, her theory was the AI ones have a very particular type of smile. They smile with teeth, but they're not all like that, but a lot of them are like that. He does look like a vampire, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So anyway, just to show, there's one about real or fake text, and I do not do well on that. Um, the other thing that I'm always talking about is that we shouldn't be automating the things we care about. And so I think that students, when they, when we give them things they care about, they won't use AI for it. And I think sometimes they use AI because they don't care. There's a lot of other reasons why they would use AI. But uh, Yasser, actually, who's here, and I, who's my former student, we wrote a little bit about the things that make students use shortcuts in the game. But since this is my fest and we talk about intentionally equitable hospitality and care a lot, I think you know, some of you in the chat were talking about your institution doing things and some of you saying people aren't having the conversations. And so we think supporting teachers with community conversations is really important. We've tried to do this in my institution from the beginning and throughout. And then supporting learners critical AI literacy rather than doing a catch and punish lens is really important and addressing the inequalities in AI and recognizing that not all students will have the same access to AI. Not all will know how to use it cleverly and the ones who use it cleverly will get away with it. That's also the problem with the detectors is someone who's a little bit clever in the way they use it will be able to get, go undetected and just rem remind students not to automate the things that they care about. Okay? I think that letting students know about the whole human sacrifice in Kenya and maybe encourage them to write like an acknowledgement of the human sacrifice that went into it useful. Um, I'm going to share a couple of resources that I need to run to answer my phone. So Nicola, can I just, I'm going to unshare the slides and let's see if something's happening in the chat. I'll be back as soon as I get the phone call. Sure, that's fine. So I see in the chat, we've got folks talking about alternative assessment. 
Yeah, Virginia, would, would you like to say a bit more about that? Yes, yeah, so, um, you know, it's the same as when technology, the internet learning, online learning um, first took off. Uh, um, people were saying, well, that means that you can fake your, your learning easier. And um, I was doing distance learning at that point. So I would give a phone call and have a discussion about what they had written. And it was very um, easy to identify those who might have cut and paste as opposed to those who had actually written something. Because um, if you engage them in their writing, then um, they're more apt to write it themselves, number one, because it shows that you're interested in what they're reading is. But I know a lot of my students have said in the past that they don't believe that teachers read what they write anyway. So why should they um, take the time to do it? So an alternative type of assessment that is in addition to the writing helps to identify did they really do this? Did they learn from this? Because that's ultimately what assessment should be. You know, have they learned from this? Is, um, so having them do a presentation, for example, not only just writing it, but doing a presentation also. Thanks, Virginia. And it actually sounds like you kind of reliving <laughs> this sort of AI response and the knee-jerk reaction. Sounds like it has been very familiar to you. Yeah. Definitely. Um, I also, older, an older person, I remember when calculators were first introduced and we weren't allowed to use calculators in the classroom because if we couldn't learn how to do it by hand, how could we possibly understand what the math was? Whereas um, what they soon learned was that you had to actually learn the math in order to use the calculator well. So I mm. think that that's the same thing that's sort of happening until we can figure out, until people, teachers can figure out how do I use this as a learning instrument, um, then you will have students that will take advantage of it, but that's to their disadvantage because ultimately they're not going to learn what they need in the fundamentals of it. Mm. So true. Maha, are you back with us? I am back. So can I can I announce your sessions about yeah, sure. uh, showcase? So Nicola is proposing to do showcases of AI tools. And if there are AI tools that you think are useful or worth sharing with other educators, um, that's the form for you to fill. We hope that some of you guys here will be willing to share some of the tools. And um, and the, the dates are here, I think. And they're also in the whole listing of all the AI sessions um, that we're doing in MyFest. So please, if you're if there's any tool that you're that you're using that you even if I think even if we have a couple of people who choose the same tool, they're probably using it in different ways or it'll be worth uh, looking at. So we'll have time for people to share and listen to each other. Um, and see what how many people are interested in that. Um, there's also another link that I wanted to share if you've never seen it before. Some group of people crowdsourced 101 creative, I think there are more than 101 creative uses of AI. So if you've never seen that slide deck, you can take a look at how different people are teaching AI or about AI or with AI. Um, and, and starting sort of critical conversations with their students as well. And I'm going to put the link to our slides again. So we had said the workshop is until 15 past. Um, and we can, we can ask you to give us feedback using this form as well. But um, I think we have 15 minutes to talk about whatever you all want to talk about. Do you want to go to breakout rooms and talk in small groups? Or who wants to talk in small groups just to reflect on the session? Raise your hand and we'll see how many people do that. And then we'll assume everybody else wants to stay in the main room and talk here. OK, looks like you all want to stay here. Let's stay here. All right, Sierra. For joining us.
<laughs> all right no problem yeah it's always when a session lasts beyond an hour a lot of people will have scheduled the hour right so i was thinking that might happen all right well, thanks folks who, who need to leave. Thanks for joining us um, and hope you got some great ideas and resources. Virginia is asking, we talk a lot about students, what's being done to train teachers. I think there's a lot of free online sessions. Like my fest, we gave a session very early on. Like I can't remember if it was January or February, but like really early on. And a lot of people were doing that, but I think not a lot of them were hands-on sort of <laughs> how do you make it work and just talking around it. So we were trying to do sort of hands-on, like try it yourself, try some prompts with it. Uh, thank you, Alia, for your takeaways here. Um, I also see in some departments, especially those who teach writing and rhetoric, they have their own WhatsApp groups and they help each other. So I've seen that they figure things out for themselves and then they share with each other. They don't wait for people like the Center for Learning and Teaching to do things for them, but not all departments will have that kind of enough people who are tech savvy enough and willing to take the risks and try things. I'm curious what's happening in other institutions though, because Jerome, you were saying nobody's doing anything or you are. I know Nicola's giving workshops at hers. I don't know who else is doing. Yeah, there's no coordinated um, uh, plan or program to discuss even the topic of AI, except to raise it uh, as if it was some kind of plague and to just warn students, please beware of AI and the chat GTP and the keep off it and so on, but nothing more than that, nothing coordinated and so on. And listening to all of you uh, this evening, it, it, it's a bit uh, challenging and frustrating at the same time because uh, I have always pioneered uh, these kinds of things. I'm already uh, holding conversations with my postgraduate students on uh, responsible ways of using AI. Fortunately, I have two PhD supervisees who are very tech savvy and they volunteered to make presentations on, on uh, you know, certain aspects of using AI. And we have had one session already. We'll have another tomorrow. But this is in, in the context of an entire university. This is a, like a, a very tiny drop in an ocean. And does not quite make a, a, a much of a difference institutionally. So when I, I, I listen to you people discussing this kind of awareness at a more institutional level, I'm impressed, but it's a bit also frustrating. Yeah, yeah, that, that sounds, someone in your institution should be responsible for this. And when you don't know who that person is or that person isn't doing the work, or maybe that person doesn't feel prepared. So in my, in my department, I was just talking to my colleagues last week. And even though I was leading on getting to learn about AI and sharing back with them, they started to, they don't feel comfortable doing it themselves. And they've only started to become comfortable now around six months later. So I imagine if, if, if it's an institution and there isn't someone who's, who's comfortable trying these things or who's willing to try these things, then maybe there isn't. It's, it's one of those things that you have to be comfortable with uncertainty. You have to be comfortable and say, I'm learning about this every day. Whatever I tell you today, that is a limitation of AI may not be a limitation tomorrow. So just today, I discovered that you can plug into GPT-4, which I don't have access to, that you can plug in something called scholarly AI, dot AI is scholar dot AI that will get you real references. Like we were always like, don't worry, ChatGPT produces, incur, you know, hallucinates references. Okay, so now you have this plugin that will get you real references. So that's not a limitation anymore. And there'll be of course other things. And so someone has to be comfortable with being wrong a lot <laughs> to, to be able to do this. And it's possible that not everyone's willing to make themselves that vulnerable. Well, one thing, I agree. One thing though that I, that I see as a um, reviewer for publications when you're talking about PhD students is that um, there are many times uh, I was the reader for a journal who had um, 
international background and language background so that non-native speakers would submit articles and I could read through it and I could see, you know, there's actually, there's good data in here. It's just the way in which they're presenting it. And then they would have to bring that to a translator, try to, and, and get, hire someone to go ahead and try to rewrite it so that it was acceptable um, for a publication. And I'm just thinking that this is one way that I think would be really useful for um, PhD students to be able to learn this, but I'm not sure, can you take data and have them take that data and then write it so that you're using your own data, but they're writing it in such a way and then you can go through and edit um, based on that. That's the part that I'm a little bit iffy about. Um, but to make it so that it's acceptable for them then to um, be publishing in international journals and in journals that may not be their first language. I totally understand that uh, perspective on, could that be helpful to people who otherwise wouldn't be able to write at all or wouldn't be able to write in a way that would be acceptable? At the same time, I keep hearing that it can be used to analyze data and I'm concerned because analysis is interpretation and that's intellectual work that I don't want a machine to do for me. I know we well, do it at different levels, but it depends on what level we're talking about here. And it's, what we not lose. The, it's not necessarily the analysis and actually what I had read was that's um, when it's an analysis, a deep analysis, that's the part that's really weak. They can usually tell right away that it's been um, generated by AI because it really doesn't do a good job of analyzing it. But is there a way in which you could take a document that you have and maybe have it rewritten so that it's, yeah. it's more... You know, it's your ideas in there. Yeah, yeah. But the Quillbot already did that, right? But ChatGPT definitely. That's what a lot of non-native speakers are saying they do with it, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll rewrite it properly, correct the grammar, all that kind of stuff, for sure. And yeah, yes, there's talking about something which I think a lot of students are also doing, which is tools like Typeset, like, uh, I think Elicit does that too, like that would summarize an article for you. So for students who are reading an article that's too jargony and difficult for them, so it'll skim it and give you the key. And you can ask it questions to tell you the particular things that you want out of it. Uh, SciSpace, Nicola, I don't remember. So I don't know what site.ai does, and I can't remember SciSpace, but I think you showed it to me before. Do you want to talk about it? Chat PDF is the one that yes, it will you. Go ahead, Nicola. Ah, oh, yes. So SciSpace, I'm just going to try and find the link. That is the one that will summarize and that has got some um, kind of pre uh, like decided prompts, but you can also have your own ones. Oh, it's also called typeset.io. Okay, we're on there. I'll yeah, I always the remember the typeset because that's the website. <laughs> So lots of tools discussed here today. So I'm hoping we'll get some volunteers. Um, so there are, yeah, there are two dates um, for the sessions I'm facilitating. And I'm hoping it will be like a mad tea party. Or, well, I guess the structure is a little different. Um, so we've got folks uh, showcasing tools and explaining how they're useful and ways that other educators might find useful, followed by you know, breakout rooms for the different tools that you can actually go to and learn more. Ah, thanks, Maha, for sharing the link. That has the dates and it also has the form that you fill to say that you have a tool that you're willing to showcase. And you don't have to be like an expert in the tool, right? Just tell us this is a tool you've used. And thank you, Jenny, you're the first person to fill this form. <laughs> oh, 
I hope that others will also be willing to do that. All right, Jerome, thank you. Okay. Mahal, yeah, you just lagged on my side. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, "What's going on? Nobody's moving." <laughs> I could see Heather moving, moving, and then Kathy. Yeah, no, uh, it was on my side. Definitely. Okay, huh? Kathy. Yeah, would you be willing to present about that one? I've never used it. Yeah, we've not used it yet. We're going to experiment with it. So. But it, it, yeah, it might be August before we try it out for the first time, but I'll let you know how it goes. If okay, anybody else of, has used it, I'd love to know. Uh, we have, we, one of Nicholas sessions is in August. So if you've used it by then. Uh, so the dates were, Oh, did I say, I think I wrote, it should be Wednesday, July 8th, and I wrote Tuesday. Right, Nicola? Should be Wednesday, July, August 8th. Yeah, Tuesday, yeah. Should be August 8th. That's the other date. But no pressure, maybe folks can go and have a think. And yeah, when you get a moment, uh, please add to the form. Uh, you know where to find it. That's the one on showcasing free AI tools, or even it doesn't have to be free. Maybe it's a freemium version. Maybe you can, I mean, there are a lot of tools out there that yeah. uh, the free version can sometimes give you enough of what you need. True. Sure. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.